good afternoon everyone uh thank you for joining us just one second uh am i audible yes samita you are audible okay great uh so thank you for joining us just wanted to clarify a couple of questions in the chat uh the first being that uh we have mentioned singapore as a time zone because this is a webinar curated for nris uh we will obviously be talking about india so even if you're from uh india i think this is going to be a relevant session for you over and above this uh we will begin in a couple of minutes we're still seeing people enter the room so just give us until 135 to start thank you okay uh i think we can begin because no new people are joining so thank you everyone for making time this weekend to come and have this conversation on betting on india and getting it right uh we chosen to host this webinar at an appropriate time yesterday the gdp numbers came out and uh we did much better than expected our growth has been at 7.6% uh, as opposed to an estimate of 6.8% there are some sectors in the economy that are doing really well so if we look at um manufacturing and construction these uh segments have grown at 13 plus percent or even capital formation which would affect say your banking financial services that has grown at around 11% but then uh, you also have certain sectors in the economy that are not doing as well as they could be uh, and some of those themes are around agriculture and consumption so without further ado let's get into how what is it that actually nris really want when they're looking at india as an investment destination so i think it's pretty obvious that the first thing is that you want an investment experience that is the greatest of all time right we are in the perfect decade to allocate to india so much is happening which is in our favor um so what could give you this kind of experience i think the first is to have goal based investments for many nris or global citizens there is some level of goals that you have within india so some people look at retiring in india some people look at philanthropy in india there is always an india oriented goal that you need to start saving towards and there is no better way to manage currency risks than to have continuous investments that are happening in the uh, currency denomination that you plan to have the expense in the second thing that you want is operational ease right so as somebody who is living abroad what we've noticed is uh, that there's always trouble when it comes to an asset class like real estate because managing it from uh, afar turns out to be quite challenging so you want an investment where it's easy for you to transact it's easy for you to understand what's happening uh, and it's easy for you to track and monitor that performance so that would bring us towards financial assets right so within that you also want asset transparency which essentially means that you want to know what you own you want to be able to track it you want clear reporting and clear um uh, sort of understanding of what the underlying holdings are now in the more complex products that are often marketed to nris there isn't enough transparency in what the underlying holdings are what the risk profiles of those securities are so it again brings us back to uh, understanding products which would deliver on the transparency requirements and the reporting structures and the last is that you want transactional efficiency right so uh, in terms of each transaction how is it uh, like how much does it uh, cost you not just in terms of money but in terms of time uh, are you going to be able to manage that because as an nra you are living in a different time zone you want to be able to transact during indian market hours 
And so how do you make sure that if you're investing in financial assets, you're able to tick off all of these experiences? Because as long as you get this formula right, you're going to have a great overall investment experience. There's a lot that my colleagues, Harshil and Roshan, are going to take you through in terms of why India is a great place to uh, invest. But I'd also give you a brief overview of some of the most powerful themes uh, here. So if we look at the themes of 2024, uh, we first have consumption. Although growth in this sector has been low, uh, we need to look at the larger trend. So maybe in terms of FMCG, we are in a mature market and you're not going to see much outlier growth there. But on the consumer discretionary side, we need to understand that there are some demographic trends that are going to drive consumption. So we have a much uh, younger population we, the younger population is actually richer than previous generations and more aspirational. And that is going to drive consumption. On the manufacturing side, we've had several new uh, initiatives and incentives come in over the last five to 10 years. And that has really boosted uh, manufacturing. So recently, the PLI schemes uh, have been industry specific. So that allows a more targeted focused approach towards developing the manufacturing sector. You also have um, the China plus one strategy, which has given a boost to this because essentially in China plus one, you're looking at other cheap producers and India is one of the uh, nations that has benefited the most from this trend. Also, if we look at the last few budgets, what has been the priority? The priority has always been to push infrastructure. So if we look at road development, railways, um, this year, I think one of the things that has been grabbing headlines is the dedicated freight corridor. So with all of these coming in, it's not just about infrastructure. Your logistics is going to expand. Uh, connectivity is going to expand. Uh, there's a lot that could come in from these large themes. And what is making it happen is basically your financial services. So on the financial services side, uh, we had a big bank cleanup. So if we rewind maybe three, four years in 2019, uh, we were in a very difficult position from a financial perspective because bank balance sheets needed to be cleaned up. This whole process of cleaning up and recapitalization was quite painful. And COVID kind of gave the economy that time to recover. And now as the world is slowing down and primarily because of that context also, there wasn't too much of um, fiscal excesses that happened during COVID. The policies were structured in such a way that we stayed within our budget. Uh, and that has basically made both the RBI balance sheet as well as corporate balance sheets much stronger, right? Uh, and now banks are actually in a position where they've been able to lend more. And when I talked to you about the uh, growth numbers that came in, we talked about capital formation and we saw how that has been uh, above 11%. And uh, the other policy initiative that has really contributed to this trend has been the jam trinity. So there's been a lot more financial inclusion that has happened with the um, initiative of Jandan, Aadhaar and Mobile. So you're seeing people who never had access to a bank account, who never had access to financial savings. All of these people are being brought into the more formal uh, net of savings. And if that isn't enough, if we look at CDSL numbers in terms of how many DMAT accounts were open, uh, in November, they reported that 10 crore accounts had been opened, right? And uh, this has all happened in the last three to four years. If we And now we're also going to look at flows, which will give you a sense of how strong the savings economy is. And lastly, we have global technology. So my colleague Harshal and I had talked about uh, semiconductors in November. Uh, we'd also published a blog on ESDN. So the idea is that uh, today there is a demand for higher level technology. So there's a lot of buzz around AI, um, you're having a lot of uh, insight into how people want smarter devices. So whether it's home appliances, whether it's uh, wearable technology, whether it's in the health um, sector, there's a lot of demand for better technology. And with better technology, 
you will not have just one or two players there's a whole bunch of people who are contributing to that uh, space both from the hardware till the software till your end user stage that's a very segmented industry with a lot of specialization so now we'll just quickly take a look at the flows story which will tell us what is really happening in our domestic markets so if we look at the data month on month uh, this year has been fairly difficult in terms of fii flows uh, in the sense the first two months you had a lot of outflows uh, from the uh, fii side and the last few months have also been quite negative but on the dii side we only had two months of negative flows and both of those months uh, were at times when foreign flows were quite strong so net net the amount of money that has come into indian markets this year has been close to 1.08 crore crore that's like just think about that number uh, and most of it has actually come from uh, dii's and your dii's are uh, essentially financial institutions mutual fund houses and if you look at uh, how much people are saving how uh, how much more awareness there is about products like mutual funds today then you can clearly see that there is a trend that is moving towards a financialization of savings so what impact did these flows have on our markets so the first thing that we need to notice is whenever there have been heavy flows in the past markets have corrected quite steeply so the first month or two we had like weak markets but since then uh, august to september or august to november has been a relatively difficult time in the market uh, in terms of flows meaning from foreign institutional investors there's been outflows in the last few months but if you see the market has more or less held its ground right we haven't had a crash because money has gone out uh we've had continuous retail participation in uh markets and i think this is where we need to understand that uh things are going to be different in the future and with that i'll hand over to my colleague roshan uh thank you samyukta so so what is the india opportunity right um and how have we seen a change over the last 5 years so we've seen gst and ibc right uh, these have transformed india to a more compliant economy and your tax revenues have become buoyant again right and the and the ibc has also brought in um, some solutions to um, long standing issues right issues that were plaguing the economy for years the ibc has come in and resolved those and the process of you know actually declaring insolvency and bringing up a resolution that has come a long way from um, you know when we first saw the ibc uh, implemented to um, you know where we are today right and it's now most uh, and it's now more structured and um, and has more guidelines and clearer guidelines right and um, so all of uh these like the insolvency and um the nclt right all of these have um, greatly helped clean up our financial system so our banks are well uh, are very well capitalized your um npas are at multi year lows right the banking system has gotten cleaner and um you know the adoption of technology by the banks has also gone up right it's um it's continuously going up and you've seen banks start to lend again as well your credit is grown now the production linked incentive scheme um this is um, another um, very interesting opportunity right um this is opened up more avenues for the manufacturing sector and it's also created a lot of jobs so now if we look at electronics manufacturing um this has been the most successful part of the pli scheme and um, this attracted investments of around um, 5000 crores and um, this has contributed to um, the and this has contributed to a production value 
right, of around 2 lakh crores. And out of these 2 lakh crores, around 80,000 crores were export oriented, right? And moving to the export sector, um, this is also expected to see, um, you know, incredible growth in the coming years. We've already seen companies like Apple move to India for a part of their ma uh, for a part of their manufacturing and export as well, right? Um, and this has happened for um, around two years. So this started last year and is you know and has continued into this year. So if we see pre-COVID, right, um, India's manufacturing export sector was traditionally seen um, as, um, you know, um, it was growing, but the growth was between 5 and 10%. But um, if we see a report from Bain, um, according to them, for, over the, uh, for the last two years, we've seen an annual growth rate of over 15%, right? So... Um, various factors such as um, supply chain diversification, the PLI scheme, right? More capex investments into manufacturing, uh, higher m and activity, and um, you know, venture capital activity into the manufacturing sector are all contributing to making India a global heavyweight. So now, what is the future, right? So a clear export strategy for companies, right? the right partnerships and the right execution and efficient capex. All of these factors can, you know, propel Indian companies to um, global recognition and this can happen much sooner than you think. Uh, Sam, you can move to the next slide. Right, so here are a few investment favorites um, that we've that we've noticed that um, you know NRIs generally tend to favor, right? So when it comes to NREFTs, um, the investment horizon is the key, right? So and um, the investment horizon is set by the banks. So if you're investing with a goal and it doesn't work with the investment horizon you're given by the banks, it's kind of inflexible. Right. But that being said, it's a very good option for NRI investors as, um, you know, it's tax free and the returns are fairly attractive, but you're only going to get fixed income sort of returns over here. You'll get slightly higher. Uh, you, you'll get a slightly higher return than an FT. Right. So another thing we've no, we've noticed a lot is um, insurance, right? So um, in this year's budget, the tax benefits for endowment policies and money back policies have been uh, reversed for premiums exceeding five lakhs. And similarly for ULIPs, the maturity proceeds from the investment might be taxed as well, right? And in the long term, these options would neither provide you with sufficient cover right, with the insurance part, nor do they provide, um, you know, um, sufficient returns. And the returns from these products would be similar to a bank FD or in some cases below that as well. And with ULIPS, your added costs could um, eat into the underlying funds returns, right, which the fund may do well enough, but since your costs are higher, right, your end returns a lot. So what can you do? Um, instead of a ULIP, right, you might look into buying, uh, uh, look, you might look into um, buying a term insurance plan, right, um, for your insurance cover and look towards other avenues for um, investments and uh, exposure into capital markets, right? And this option would probably end up cheaper for you and would give you better returns in the long term for your investment part and would give you adequate cover as um, you buy a term insurance. So moving on to real estate, right? Um, as Sam touched on earlier, um, finding and monitoring um, your, um, you know, tenants is your first major hurdle. And there's also the question of tenant behavior with regards to maintaining the property and paying rent on time, right? So 
if you leave your house idle for a long time or even if it is occupied right um, eventually the repairs uh, might also need to be made and um, this would end up you know costing you more and if your house is kept idle for too long an asset which is supposed to create income for you through rent might end up costing you more than um, you expect just to maintain it right so our um, final um, investment favorite are uh, structured products right so what are structured products so these are um, debenture esque they mostly come in the form of ncds right and they're more often than not linked to an index in most cases the nifty right so if this sounds familiar to you mlds are a type of structured product right and these come with predefined conditions on returns based on the underlying performance of the index right um another thing to keep in mind is your risk profile most investors do not have the adequate risk profile to comfortably invest in structured products and sleep soundly at night right they are in essence a derivative product and in some cases these can be extremely um, you know complex with various stipulations um, regarding the payoff of the product and in some cases they are um, fee heavy and the payoff is not worth the risk in most cases and if you um, you know if you look more into it if you actually look at the numbers and um, you know do a little bit of work um, you'll find that by actually investing directly in the underlying index you could make higher returns over the period and a key factor is liquidity structured products are mostly illiquid but if you buy the underlying index um, say the mostly linked to the nifty 50 and you buy the nifty 50 it's one of the most liquid um, you know indices available in the market sam you can move to the next okay now let's look at a few ways to address some common investment mistakes right um first one is priority so your priority must always be to beat inflation right chasing after higher returns um almost always leads to a recency bias and as a chaser you're always on the back foot so um if if we make smart investment decisions the returns will come in due time right um investment returns are in most cases linked to uh, industrial factors or macroeconomic factors right so your return expectations must be linked to those as well right and um if we make investment decisions based on future macro outlook or future industry outlook um and not on the past um you know performance of a particular can be a fund an index or a stock right you should always look to um make investments based on what the future outlook is so when investing in the in a product right um you pay attention to the cost versus what the product does and the work that goes into it a cheap fund might not necessarily mean the best value right or a very expensive fund will probably not necessarily mean the best performance right so you have to look at the cost um more holistically and not just based on you know what the fund has done or the stock has done um 5 6 7 years right so for over most of the last decade um we've seen leverage work really well and this is because the cost of capital was cheap now borrowing costs are at a uh, multi year highs across the globe right but we still see a lot of investors uh, borrowing and investing so this will not work as well as it did the last decade because essentially your costs have gone up right so if i was borrowing at 3% and i made 9% that's a good 6% right but now if i'm borrowing at 6% and i make 10% i only make 4% returns right so that's the general gist of leverage your cost is key so again complexity is not equal to performance 
right? A complex product does not necessarily mean a better product or a product that would deliver outsized returns. We saw this in the last slide regarding structured products again. Um, a lot of complex products may hide structural disadvantages behind the complexity. So this is what most structured products actually do. Um, so a greater amount of attention and skepticism is warranted, right? Uh, be very careful and also keep in mind your risk profile, right? Would you be, you know, comfortable investing in these? That's the real question. So coming on to prioritizing tax, right? So again, naturally tax is a factor that all investors will consider and they have every right to do that. But um, uh, if you ask me when, um, uh, when um, you know, over relying on tax harms the portfolio is when taxation drives investment behavior. When a certain asset class might be very attractive, right, expected to outperform, um, you know, the other asset classes for that year, right? Um, investors may, you know, neglect that asset with the only reason being that it attracts a higher amount of taxation, right? Um, and when this happens, this hinders investment performance, right? You should always look at what the payoff is and what the um, risk adjusted reward is um, with um, investment A versus investment B. Now, when coming to currency, right, um, they are very tricky to predict even for, um, you know, seasoned uh, currency traders, right? as there are too many factors involved. So you can optimize currency risk by minimizing layers in your portfolio. So for example, when you're making foreign investments, try to be more direct, right? Um, so if we take the case of um, a few fund of funds, right? They may route investments through multiple countries and multiple currencies, right? So all of these layers, um, they add to the, complexity and they also add to the currency risk in your uh, underlying investment right so if we we can um, you know further um, optimize for lack of a better word the currency risk in your portfolio uh, sam you can move on to the next yeah so um, this brings me to the end of uh, my part of the presentation. So before I hand it over to Hushal, um which asset class do you think is the best for wealth creation? So if you can vote in the poll, um, we'll explore uh, this aspect um, in the next part of the presentation. So Hushal, uh, over to you. Thanks, thanks, Roshan. I'm just having a little issue with my uh, camera, so uh, please bear with me. So let's look at uh, the poll. Uh, so do type in, you know, uh, your answers in uh, the chat box, or uh, you can just vote. Uh, so which asset classes is the best for wealth creation? Uh, there's emerging market equity. There's global. Uh, of course, there are precious metals and commodities. And last, fixed income and REIT. So I've, I'm already seeing answers coming in. Uh, Okay, we're getting good answers from emerging. Okay, emerging global. Okay. Okay. So there's gold coming in. Okay. Somebody has said gold also. Gold and commodities. Okay. Okay, I think uh, it's good. Uh, they, they're very good uh, responses. Uh, is is emerging? Is Indian market also part of emerging? Yeah, it is. It is definitely part of emerging. So put in your vote, and then I'll I'll move forward. Somebody said depends on a person to person. Okay, I think Sam, you can you can just move on. So I think most of you have said emerging equity along with a mix of uh, gold and commodities. So 
let's look at this, right? Everybody is a winner, right? Everybody is a winner because cycles keep turning, cycles keep changing. Not every cycle is the same. Now you look at 2000 to 2005. This is a cycle where uh, commodities did extremely well. You look at 2000 all the way up until 2005. There was only one bad year for commodities, but uh, uh, they were coming. Th that was from you know a high point. But from there on, you see 2005, 2006, 2007. All these years, commodities did extremely well. Right? Why did they do extremely well? Because the world was spending. Right? China was expanding uh, and China was leading the front for infrastructure spending. That's why you had a huge boom in commodities. That's why you had commodity upcycle here even in India, where a lot of capacity was added. A lot of leverage was taken to add these capacities. And then you know what happened after 2000, 2010, after the global financial crisis. See from 2010 onwards, you're seeing commodities go through a long cycle of correction because there was deleveraging that had to take place. Uh, uh, bloated businesses had to go out of business. Consolidation had to happen. But in that while, look what has happened. There has been a shift of, of money from commodities all the way up until technology oriented. Right? You see S&P 500. S&P 500 has been roaring since 2010. A lot of shift in money has happened. Right. And you see somewhere down the line, emerging markets have played a role. And within emerging markets, you have seen China play a huge role when it comes to performance. And right now, China is not in a great shape to go out and start putting up performance. So that's why you, you see, again, we are going into infrastructure spending globally. Again, we are going into a decade where global growth has to be driven by certain parts of the world. Uh, and emerging markets need to lead the front and only then developed markets can lead that front. But again, you're seeing since 2020, since 2019, your commodities are coming back in play and you're seeing commodities again come up. Along with that, because the risks keep going up, right? you're seeing gold doing extremely well. You saw the cycle of gold do extremely well within 2000 to 2010 as a cycle. And then from there on, you saw gold coming off its peak and then again gold mining companies had to go through trouble they had to go through deleveraging and they had to go through consolidation smaller ones had to go off larger ones had to consolidate and that's how the cycle goes so we are in this cycle right now where emerging nations are taking forefront in in terms of growth and india is the best place for any anybody looking to invest in the emerging market space where we are the only country that is giving you seven percent odd growth right and within that there are sectors that are growing very fast. You are seeing infrastructure development taking place uh, at a very fast pace. The government has committed to a huge sum of money. Money that has not been committed in the last 10 years, money that much 10 lakh crore odd money is, is being committed in one year. Right. So cycles work differently. And uh, uh, in every cycle, there is a winner and not necessary that the winner in the past cycle uh, will be the winner in the next cycle uh, and that the loser in the previous cycle happens to be the loser in the next cycle. This is not the case always. So winners keep changing, losers keep changing. It depends on the cycle. And where we are currently on this cycle, we definitely think that emerging markets are a great place uh, for investors to invest in. And within emerging markets, India happens to be a very good place. So if you go on to the next time, if you can go on to the next slide, I'll show you who uh, among the emerging and the developed are really taking forefront. Right. So here you go. This is what I was talking to you about how uh, from 2000 all the way up until, you know, 2015, 2018, uh, that entire period, right? You see US sort of uh, uh, leading performance and then you see India is somewhere at the bottom uh, because we were again in two th between that entire 2000 to 2010 cycle. Uh, our markets were extremely overweight on commodities, be it steel, aluminum, oil, uh, we were extremely overweight on these sectors, right? And uh, these sectors, like any other sector, they are sensitive to economic activity. And we had to go through an entire period of uh, change in leadership. Right now, today, the index is heavyweight on the bank side, banks and financial services that happen to be 30, 38% of the entire uh, index. So you are already seeing that reflection coming in. Right? from 2000 all the way up until now, you saw how India was faltering back, though we had good GDP growth coming in after uh, it was more consumption oriented, right? And since 17, we have seen a lot of changes in India, both in terms of regulation and in terms of organization. 
like we've had a lot of industries that were unorganized becoming organized uh, a lot of formal organization has taken place which is leading india's growth okay. one great example is upi uh, nobody in the world has the same technology as upi and uh, today whenever you transfer money on upi or paytm wherever the, anybody using that technology stack anybody using that api it shows you that your money has gone within 30 seconds right? and this sort of technology is now being exported that's why in the previous slides we talked about how from 17 from the uh, uh, from 17 onwards where we were more make in india uh, that sort of translated now to make for the world right so we are exporting whatever we had made for make in india now for make for the world right you are already seeing one more lot of Uh, uh investments coming in on the semiconductor side where india does want to become uh, a global hub when it comes to uh, the entire semiconductor manufacturing process so a lot of work is going in not only in terms of technology but in terms of manufacturing as well right so now if you see this year onwards india has sort of picked up its pace uh, and developed markets have gone back down so if you see uh, the entire world is majorly driven by uh, europe and usa uh that's where the overweight lies and in the last couple of years since covid uh, they have not sort of contributed to that growth at all so winners are rotating and right now in this decade we we are of the view that emerging nations particularly india and then uh, china of course because there are deep problems happening on the chinese side uh, which will not remain as a problem for a very long period of time they were old they were going on old economics where the money was coming in majorly from real estate and now they're going into new, into a new economy new economy sort of a a model that is more technology oriented uh, so we do believe that yes given the conditions that are there uh, india is uh, in a very good shape uh, uh, to win in this in this particular cycle right uh, so i'm going to go on to the next slide yeah so let's talk a little bit about neo so neo was not developed in one in one year or or two years uh, this is a model that we have uh, 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 that has already been in the works for 12 years uh, this is a model that we used to run as an advisory service uh, that has now become a pms so uh, that advisory service we were running for uh, 12 years uh, and that is now coming in as neo and there was a question on why um, uh, what is so different with neo that a mutual fund uh, uh, cannot do so what we do different is uh we don't have a particular cap on any asset class which means that uh, it's dynamic it's flexible it's it's flexi asset which means that we can go 0 to 100 in any asset class uh, be it equity be it debt be it global uh, be it gold or commodities as well right so we don't have a particular cap what's happening in the industry when they run this sort of a model particularly in mutual funds uh, uh, they need to have a particular cap uh, at least some percentage of money has to be within one asset class and they have to operate within that uh, no matter what the choice is like right? money just has to go there uh, uh, even if it does not make sense or there are no opportunities there money just has to flow there so that's what something is that we're doing different and you're you're getting all of this at the same cost of that of a direct mutual fund so uh, operationally and transaction wise we are much more better off than a particular mutual fund uh, at the same cost because we are able to deliver that sort of return to you with more or less the same cost structure right so we are able to laterally shift between asset classes with ease uh, and also take advantage of whatever opportunities that are coming in uh, in each of these spaces so within equity it's not necessary for us to go only towards direct stocks we can go to as etfs also and i just did a presentation uh, in the morning about how etfs are so uh, underutilized in india where a majority of the money on passive side is only going towards large caps uh, and the entire the other side of the segment that are more sectoral oriented that are more thematic oriented are left out and most of the performance right now that you will see in the later slides that are to do with uh neo has to do with a mix of equity direct stocks and equity etfs right and there are all sectoral etfs it's not pure large cap or pure mid cap etfs we have built our expertise on on this 12 years uh, uh to master how sectors work to master how cycles work and only then take a call right so uh, that's how we are able to laterally shift and between assets between asset classes so that it can lead to higher returns so this is uh, curated exclusively for for, for nris right that's operationally uh, we we make sure that whatever issues you have in terms of taxation your oci uh, everything comes into consideration here right uh, you can move on to the next slide
right so uh, this is a formula where uh, we say if anybody who is looking to invest in india and and choosing new uh, to bet on india yes we uh, are able to be in the right asset at the right time and at the right place so uh, when we build out positions uh, we don't run a model portfolio every portfolio is different every investor's portfolio is different because uh, it depends on the opportunity at that point of time when the investor comes in somebody who came in 6 months back would not have the same portfolio as that of somebody who comes in now right so which means that we are at the right asset class for them we are at the right time for them we are at the right place for them right so that we we understand that opportunities keep on coming newer opportunities keep on coming and hence we believe that only if an investor can engage with those opportunities we will be able to really capture that performance for for that investor right that doesn't mean that uh, uh, in a, usually in a model portfolio what happens is if a particular position does come in uh, uh, it comes in for everybody it does not make sense for everybody to go out and sort of uh, do that right uh, you have to calibrate your position sizing and uh, that's what we are able to do for every investor that comes in at any point in time right uh, that's why we believe that with consistent contribution uh, we will be able to engage with those opportunities and make sure that yes you are very well adequated for that opportunity for it to work for you right so and at the end if you are aligning your investments to a particular target obviously when you uh, uh, in india you think of coming back here you want to see it as a business opportunity you want to start a venture here or you want to retire here or you want to use it for any other particular goal all those investments will be made per that particular goal and per that particular uh, uh the, the the risk that is involved in that uh, and the understanding of that risk is how we will assign or we will align those investments to right uh you can move on to the next slide right so right now if you see neo uh, uh 66% all of of our money is 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 in direct equity uh it's a mix of uh direct and uh, etfs Uh, we do invest in precious metals. Uh, that's about twenty percent out of the portfolio. Uh, global happens to be four percent. It's still small. We do keep keep cash. We are never fully deployed unless and until there's a great opportunity for us to come. Uh, we like to take time to build positions in great businesses because we understand that uh, uh, great businesses come at uh, a slight price, but uh, when it it does come to our valuation radar, uh, we don't hold back. We are quite aggressive when it comes to uh, allocating uh, uh, money when the right opportunity comes. and also we have some debt on our books we do think that right now the opportunity is uh, uh uh quite vivid in terms of debt we do have opportunities on the short term side we are not trying to take a longer term duration risk but we do understand that uh, within the entire uh, uh tenure we do have some opportunities that are coming up not only here there are opportunities coming up globally as well uh, so we are still exploring but wherever we've been able to allocate money towards towards debt towards that one particular part uh we have been able to do it uh so in just in terms of performance uh, uh neo since inception is about 22% uh and as we stand as of the month of october we come under the top 3 performing multi asset pmss in india with this strategy uh and we started uh, in 2020 uh, uh in 2021 so uh it has been a great journey and uh, our endeavor is uh is consistent performance because we understand that cycles take time to play every every cycle has a win, different winner different loser so our endeavor is to grow at high rates and and uh maintain performance and to create stable returns for you so that when you come back to india whatever you want to build all your uh goals and all your uh, targets uh that you want to meet uh we are very excited for you to join in uh and we will help you meet that Done. So, what's our priority now? The solution uh, is how uh, how do we look at this market? We uh, we want to beat inflation. Right now, our inflation is about uh, it's it's in that band of four uh, to six. Two uh, to six is uh, I mean four plus minus two is what the mandate is. We are well within that mandate, but globally we do find issues uh, when it comes to inflation. Uh, you would hear something coming in with the Fed meet. so at that point in time uh, again we would have to re uh, rethink scenarios uh, pay attention to cost uh, leverage works only when it's cheap 
I don't think that's a strategy that anybody should do. Uh, it's not viable. It should not be viable. Uh, even Sebi has put out a a good uh, good amount of data when it comes to how uh, leverage has worked out and uh, what is the success rate of of leverage really playing out, right? Uh, When you look at complexity, it does not really mean performance. Uh, that as things keep getting complex, it's very it's going to become very hard for uh, fund managers and investment managers uh, across the world uh, to deliver performance. So don't get carried away by something that's very complex that can give you back-tested data to show you that uh, yes, we will be able to do this. No, uh, stick for something that is extremely real-time. We have validated data of real-time performance, uh, and I think that every investor should stick to that. Right. I think we can open the floor for uh, questions. Uh, can you put the slide for uh, the number as well? Yeah, we just keep the slide open. Uh, so in case we are not able to meet any of your queries, uh, you can note down this number. You can get in touch with us. Uh, uh, on the email ID, uh, and we'll open the floor for questions. Whatever questions uh, in your viewer, please put it down on uh, the chat box. Sorry, are you able to hear me? Okay. Um, so what I was saying was that uh, with respect to the question on how can NRIs join PMS when they already have a PIS account opened with another DP, I um, so the restriction is if you have an NRE account, you can open only one PIS account. But if you are operating your investments in India through an NRO account, you can have multiple um, um, DPIDs. That's not going to be a problem. However, when we curated Sphere Neo, one of the things that we were very conscious of was this constraint that NRIs had, right? So we wanted to create an investment experience that does not get limited by the fact that you can open only one PIS account. The idea of having a multi-asset PMS is that you don't need anything else. Uh, everything that you need, all your investment needs are going to be met by this one product. Uh, so, Answering the second question, which is how is Sphere better than a mutual fund? I think Hushal had touched upon a few points in terms of what is the asset allocation uh, requirements, meaning we are truly very dynamic in the asset allocation process, uh, meaning we can go from zero to 100 in any asset class, whereas most um, uh, mutual funds have mandate restrictions that would either limit the number of asset classes that can be in the portfolio or the percentage that would be allocated to each investment. Do we have any other questions? Like, please feel free to type it into the chat box. Uh, you can ask us anything about the product. You can ask us about the markets. We've shared a lot of data. Um, if you generally have some questions about how your investments in India should uh, be structured or what you need to do at this point, like we, we're open to answering anything. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, I'll just repeat. So what I said in terms of the um, question as to for NRIs, if they already have a PIS account, how would they open an account with uh, CAPMS like Sphere? Uh, the answer is, that if you are operating through an NRE account, then there is a restriction for just one DMAT account. However, if uh, you're opening it through the NRO account, there is no restriction. But as a house, we have been very cognizant of the fact that NRIs do have this limitation. And uh, because of that, we have curated a multi-asset product which can be more dynamic and which responds to markets as well as opportunities and which allows investors to participate more than just once, right? This is not like a buy and forget it kind of product. You can continuously add into your portfolio. And um, I'm also happy to report that we are a young product in terms of NEO, meaning we've been in the market only for about a year and a few months. 
but we're doing exceptionally uh, good work for investors. So there's a lot that has gone into the product curation itself. And uh, in terms of, uh, so sorry, getting back to the NRO account, I think repatriation is not a problem. You would just need uh, some documentation from your auditor with respect to the source of income. But the operational ease is higher in the NRE account. Um, so whether in terms of whether this is better than a mutual fund or not, I think the performance numbers will show you uh, that we are uh, fairly on top of the game here. Uh, the second aspect is also in terms of flexibility. This is uh, truly more multi-asset than most other products are. Uh, it's also far more curated. So if you look at our thematic split or the way that we've been uh, servicing customers and how uh, the curation happens, because at the end of the day, uh, if you're a mutual fund uh, investor, then you're getting the same portfolio as everybody else. But just like Harshil mentioned, when you start investing, the opportunities are going to be different. How much you're able to participate in future opportunities will also allow you to have a slightly more curated and individual portfolio within the broad universe of NEO. And in certain cases, like I think for uh, US-based NRIs, there might be a lot of restrictions in terms of which mutual funds they can invest in. Whereas here, uh, you don't really have those kind of uh, drawbacks. Uh, we'll just give it a few more minutes because we have that time. Uh, but before we close, I would like to thank everyone who's come in today uh, and spent this one hour asking questions and participating in this webinar. It means a lot to us. These are our coordinates. If you want to get in touch with us one-on-one, -on -one, uh, if there's some question that you feel that you'd prefer to ask on a one-on-one -on -one basis as opposed to like in a public forum like a webinar, please do drop us a message at 9500272285. We're available on WhatsApp uh, and our team will get back to you. You could also tell them that you want to meet one of us and we can set up a meeting in the coming week to engage with you on an individual basis. If you have any other queries, like if you want to uh, be up to date on future webinars, because sometimes we do product-based webinars, sometimes we do uh, things on Teams. I think Harshil can also vouch for that. You can always be uh, informed of these things. And um, yeah, I think that's about it from our side. Thanks once again. Uh, thank you, everyone. We'll be ending the webinar for uh, everyone now. Uh, and you can uh, sort of know more about us or you can drop us a message on WhatsApp. Uh, have a great weekend.